Patty Krieger. Patty had been hiking with her boyfriend, Larry Presley, her Rottweiler, Bear, James Presley, Nicole Gardner, Troy Robinson, Chrissy Jones Bumgardner, and Matt Robinson. According to those Patty was with, they had been on the mountain that day to spread the ashes of Larry's deceased parents, who had passed away several months earlier. The group Patty was hiking with says that Patty became emotional after the ceremony and that she headed down a different trail than the rest of the hikers. They say she figured the trails would reconnect and that they would meet Patty and her dog Bear back at the trailhead. Patty and Bear never showed up. Patty's car keys and driver's license were found to be in possession of the individuals that she was hiking with. Patty's cell phone was in the possession of one of Larry Presley's friends back at Patty's house. It is unclear if there were any other personal items in Patty's possession at the time of her disappearance. It should be noted that Patty used hearing aids. After learning that their 65-year-old friend, Patty Krieger, had not made it back to the trailhead, the hikers Patty was with decided not to wait around for her and instead left the mountain. Larry Presley, Patty's boyfriend, went with some of the other hikers to a local gas station and bought burritos and beer. Some of the other hikers went to a local supermarket and went grocery shopping. Four hours later, Larry and some of his friends went back to Sauk Mountain at that time and reported Patty missing. When Larry Presley and his family and friends reported Patty missing, they claimed to be Patty's family and her actual family was not notified of her disappearance. According to her son, he was not alerted to her missing status until the next day, a Sunday, when she didn't show up for her job. Patty had worked for Fred Myers for 30 years, and when she was absent, her boss immediately called her and then called her emergency contact, her son. Her son, after not being able to contact his mother, went to file a police report and found that one had already been opened the day before. Patty Krieger and Bear were officially missing. Within 48 hours, search teams for four counties arrived and by foot searched the mountain and the trails with no results. The day after, a helicopter search was started using forward-looking infrared technology with no results. Search and rescue dogs were used at some point within the first 48 hours. They hit on the parking lot and on the main trail which led police to believe she had in fact gotten off the mountain, perhaps after her group had left. By the 10th of April, police had officially stated they did not believe she was still on the mountain. 26 days after she disappears, her dog Bear is found in poor condition, malnourished and emaciated in the area of Sauk Mountain. After her dog was found, police changed their theory, believing that she may not have left the mountain after all. There are several theories on Patty's disappearance. There's a possibility that she could have easily fallen and injured herself, eventually succumbing to the elements. And then there is one theory which suggests that Larry, Patty's boyfriend, killed her and disposed of her body. It is mentioned several times in various news articles that her boyfriend Presley was a felon, and one source, K5 News, states that he had been sentenced previously for child rape, drive-by shooting, and assault on police officers. According to the Concrete Herald, Krieger's son, Alan Patterson, stated that two days after Krieger had gone missing, he was aiding the search when along the Sauk Mountain Road, not along the trail, he encountered Presley, who thus far had not aided in the search of Krieger. He claimed Presley was acting suspiciously. While family and friends of Patty claim that Larry Presley has been very non-cooperative with the family, he was upset when they started a Facebook page after her disappearance and confronted the family about it. When he found out that a longtime friend and co-worker of Krieger was running the Facebook page, he confronted him as well. 
He was also seen many times driving Krieger's luxury vehicles around town, as opposed to his own vehicle. The family was having a court dispute over their rights to Krieger's house and belongings. Rather than cooperate, Presley decided to vacate the home. When the family finally gained entrance, Krieger's house and belongings were described as being trashed. Titles to her cars were left out on the kitchen counters. Her safe and safety deposit box had been opened and rifled through with items missing. The family moved Krieger's vehicles to another location where they were involved in a drive-by shooting. They believe Presley is behind this as retaliation. It is also worth noting that less than a year after Krieger's disappearance, Presley was married to another woman. He is currently serving 10 years in prison for charges unrelated to Krieger's disappearance. Her son, friends, and family of Krieger believe that she is deceased and still regularly search the mountain for her remains. Kevin Race Kevin Race was a business owner in Woolrich, Maine, who went missing in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. On the 9th of September, 2007, a car belonging to Kevin Race was found in a parking lot of the Appalachian Mountain Club at the bottom of Mount Washington at the beginning of Route 16. Mount Washington is often referred to as the most dangerous small mountain in the world. With a height of only 6,288 feet, it pales in comparison to some of the many large mountains on Earth. However, many mountaineers have cited its frigid conditions and Arctic-level winds, which have reached over 230 miles an hour, as the reasoning behind the signs placed all about the trail warning hikers of grave danger. Kevin was taking a basic EMT class so that he could join Doctors Without Borders to help people in third world countries. He was an experienced and enthusiastic outdoors man who owned a successful rope company, Custom Cordage. However, he had recently come into some legal troubles having to do with his business and was indicted on charges of embezzling $250,000 from his and his partner's company. He was due for his first court appearance two days after he went missing. According to Fish and Game investigators, a note was found at Kevin's home, which led investigators to believe he was, quote, looking for his final resting place. Months after Kevin's disappearance, in January of 2008, Kevin's business partner filed an additional lawsuit alleging Kevin to now have embezzled over $500,000 from January of 2002 until the time he vanished in September of 2007, indicating he may have stolen a large amount of cash prior to disappearing. While some cite Kevin's money troubles and this note as evidence of a possible suicide, a friend of Kevin's says he was the type of guy to quote, always have a plan, and he thinks Kevin may have taken the EMT classes and done this preparation in order to live off the grid. Fellow hikers last saw Kevin at Tuckerman Shelter, which is about two miles from the top of the mountain at around 2.30 p.m. that Sunday. Despite the use of search and rescue units, law enforcement canine units, and a U.S. National Guard Black Hawk helicopter, no evidence of Kevin or his remains were ever found. Justin Alexander Shelter, 35 quit his successful job at a tech startup company in order to travel full-time. He called it retiring, but it was more like reverting back to an earlier world. Relying on the knowledge he picked up after leaving high school at the age of 16 to study wilderness survival and the art of karate, he traveled 18,000 miles across the western side of the United States. Justin experienced a significant setback in Sun Valley, Nevada, where he mistakenly trusted a stranger to provide him shelter and a much-needed shower, and instead had all of his belongings stolen by a man who was actually part of a group of meth heads. After that loss, Justin set out to discover a more simple life. Already with no possessions, he decided to go to the extreme. For his new life, he traveled to India and wore a simple bark loincloth went hunting alongside indigenous tribes, and all the while traced the path of the ancient god of Shiva. His blog, Adventures of Justin, chronicles a life many commented they envied. 
posting pictures of his treks in the snow wearing duct tape sandals and living in caves, Justin would caption pictures with statements such as, quote, going tribal with the Medawani of Indonesia and, quote, I'm free to live the life of my dreams. But those posts came to an end with the last one, posted on August 19th, 2016, reading in part, quote, a sadhu has invited me on a pilgrimage high in the Himalayas to meditate. I ran out of money and food, so he fed me each time I passed. He invited me along on his pilgrimage, three days hard trek to a lake at 13,000 feet, and then 10 days meditating in a spiritual retreat, end quote. Justin described the sadhu's eyes as, quote, 5,000 years old and those eyes were one of their only forms of communication, as this guru was supposedly a mute. Due to a post on Justin's Instagram referencing these sadhus, or gurus, his family has reason to be concerned that this man had a hand in Justin's disappearance. Justin wrote on his post, They can bless or curse. Police won't arrest them, even for murder, which happens, I'm told. I've been cold, damp, and hungry a lot recently, and feeling a bit malnourished and weak already. I should return in mid-September or so. If I'm not back by then, don't look for me. Justin's willingness to go into rough mountainous terrain of Himachal Pradesh, North India, despite a back injury that was flaring up, a vitamin deficiency, and a general fatigue, shows a man so determined to find a higher truth that he risks dying to find it. This particular area was a draw to him, as it was believed to have been the meditation location of the son of the god Shiva, who meditated there for 3,000 years. Additionally, the hot springs there were said to have healing properties. Justin left with the Nepalese Nagababa, named Sataya Narayan Rawat, on or around August 24th and on September 3rd, he was seen coming back down from the Montalai Lake, going towards a village by some tourists. They said Justin was walking alone, and that the guru had walked past a few hours earlier. The hikers offered Justin, who looked haggard and unwell, some food and a respite from his trek, but he was highly determined to reach his belongings, which were stored in the village below. Justin's Instagram post about the gurus being untouchable by police was proven untrue, as upon Justin's family sounding the alarm, the police did end up arresting the guru that he traveled with on October 15th, six weeks after Justin was last seen. Police interrogated the guru for eight days, at which point they left him alone for but a few minutes, only to come back to the room to find he had hanged himself, using the only thing he had on him, his torn and dirty loincloth. Many followers of his ideology say it was not guilt but embarrassment that caused this guru to take his life upon being questioned about his missing hiking partner. Despite forensic teams combing the countryside and rough terrain for any side of Justin or his remains, they found nothing. Some think Justin had a fall and crawled into some sort of ditch or ravine to wait to be found, while others believe he encountered foul play from either the guru or some other person unknown. Others comment on the area's reputation for being a popular hashish destination, enticing Western tourists with hash-fueled enlightenment, which can bring with it a potentially criminal enterprise. Justin may have been in the wrong place at the wrong time or witnessed a drug deal gone bad. Justin is still missing to this day, and his family has spent considerable time and energy looking for him. David Snedden At the time of his disappearance, David Snedden was a 24-year-old university student from the United States studying in Beijing over the summer of 2004. Snedden was taking a Mandarin class and had previously learned Korean while studying as a Mormon missionary in South Korea. In August, after his class finished, he decided he would travel around Western China for a few weeks before going to Seoul to meet his older brother Michael on August 26th. If you never hear from me again, look for my body in the Western Yunnan province of China or the Yellow Mountains of Anhui joked David in an email to his mother prior to his disappearance. 
His jests were proven tragically prophetic when the emails ceased. The Sneddons weren't initially worried that David hadn't contacted them in two weeks, believing he was in a remote area which lacked internet access. On August 26th, however, they received a phone call from Michael in South Korea. David had never arrived. After authorities couldn't find his body, Chinese authorities theorized that he fell to his death hiking near Tiger Leap Gorge. That had happened to hikers in the area before, but unlike David, their bodies eventually turned up. David's father and his brother went to China to retrace his last steps and found a dozen witnesses who had spoken to David after he had made it safely through the gorge. In 2011, the Sneddons received a phone call from Chuck Downs, a Pentagon official who suspected that David might have been abducted by North Korean agents. The next year, Narkin announced that a North Korean defector in China reported that a university student from the United States was arrested by authorities in August of 2004 for helping North Korean refugees. He was released the next month, but instead was handed over to five North Korean agents. Authorities fear he has been taken hostage by North Korean soldiers looking to indoctrinate foreigners or use them as spies. Others believe David encountered an accident or danger on the trail. Nine years later, the family still believes David to be alive somewhere. Paula Weldon On the afternoon of December 1, 1946, Bennington College sophomore Paula Weldon came back from her dorm room after working at the dining hall and told her roommate she was going out for a brief hike as a, quote, study break, and then left campus, heading up a trail near Glatzenberry Mountain. Dressed in a red parka coat with fur-lined hood, blue jeans, topsider shoes with thick soles, and a gold Elgin wristwatch with a black band, she made no indication that she planned on staying gone for very long. Danny Fager, who owned a gas station near the college gates, said he spotted Paula. He said he had seen her run up and then down the side of the gravel pit near the entrance of the college around 2.45 p.m. Fifteen minutes later, Weldon was hitchhiking near the Bennington campus when a passing motorist picked her up. She told him she was going to hike on the long trail off Route 9 near Glatzenbury Mountain. The driver dropped her off on Route 9, about three miles from her destination. Several others saw her that day walking on the trail. The last confirmed sighting of Weldon was at 4 p.m. that day when she spoke to a man on the trail and asked him how far it extended. He told her it went all the way to Canada. The sun set at around 5 p.m. and it began snowing a few hours after that, accumulating three inches. When she hadn't returned by the time her roommate went to bed, the roommate assumed Paula was pulling a late night of studying at the college library. But the roommate became concerned the next morning when it was clear that Paula had never returned to her dorm room. The roommate contacted college officials who organized a small search party to look for Paula Jean somewhere within the extensive campus grounds. When the college couldn't locate Paula, they called the local police. An extensive search of the long trail and its environments turned up no sign of Weldon and no significant clues. The search was hampered by the fact that Vermont had no state police at the time. Eventually, officials from Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New York stepped in to help. Investigators found a man who stated that he had seen Paula soon before her disappearance. This young man became a suspect when he told differing stories about where he had spent the evening of December 1st. Allegedly, he also told at least two friends that he knew where Paula was buried. He later claimed that he was only kidding around. Investigators initially believed Weldon had gotten lost in the mountains and died of exposure, but, as time passed without their finding any sign of her, they began to consider other theories. Authorities began to suspect that Paula's father had something to do with his daughter's disappearance. It came to light that he did not approve of a boy Paula had been seeing. He claimed this boyfriend had to be the responsible party, but his only proof came from a clairvoyant. 
Although there were reports that Paula was somewhat depressed at the time of her disappearance, her family and friends said she had only normal problems for a girl her age and was not unhappy enough to commit suicide or run away from home. She left all her belongings behind, and her family stated she was not the type of person to leave without warning. Then, nine years later, a lumberjack came forward, saying he knew where Paula's body was buried. After being questioned, he eventually admitted to making it up for publicity. Then, in 1968, a skeleton was found. It was later determined it was far too old to be Paula. There is no hard evidence of foul play in Weldon's disappearance, but many people believe she was murdered and buried somewhere in or near the Long Trail. Weldon's disappearance remains unsolved. There has been no indication of her whereabouts since 1946. Susan Adam was a 42-year-old woman who enjoyed the outdoors with her husband, Tom. Though Susan was not as experienced an outdoors person as her husband, she was excited about a camping trip to a wilderness area near Battle Lake at the Idaho-Montana border. Susan and Tom spent months researching and planning the trip and hired a tour company to help them explore. The Selway Bitterroot Wilderness is one of the largest designated wildlife areas in the United States and covered in dense coniferous forest and rugged peaks. On Saturday, September 22, 1990, the couple arrived in Idaho Falls and met with their touring team, led by Art Griffin, the owner of the touring company, and embarked on a seven-hour horseback ride to the Battle Lake area near the Bitterroot Divide. There, they set up camp and went hunting and bird watching. A week after their arrival, Tom decided to take an overnight hunting trip with his guide. Susan opted to stay behind at base camp. With another guide, Susan accompanied her husband to a ridge where he'd begin the hunt. She and the guide returned with their horses. This is the last time Tom would see his wife. The following day, September 30th, Susan reportedly spoke to the chef at base camp and told him she was going for a walk to birdwatch. Hours later, Tom returned to base camp from his hunting trip. He became worried as evening approached and Susan hadn't returned. Tom later stated that he followed her footprints from the base camp down a dusty trail and towards the meadow. Suddenly, the footprints ended with no indication of where Susan could have gone. In a statement to the police, he wrote, quote, I followed the footprints to a place about 20 yards from the meadow, where the tracks stopped. The tour guides and Tom searched for Susan all night and the next morning, and they sent a guide to town to alert the authorities. Tom worked for the governor of Texas and was able to send a request to the National Guard to free up helicopters for the search. A thorough air and ground search commenced throughout the area. Sheriff Randy Baldwin was impassioned by the search, and he even went on a hunger strike in solidarity with Susan, with others citing that, quote, Baldwin figured if Susan was out there hungry, he would be too. By Tuesday, snow and cold had grimly halted the search. Chances of Susan's survival had diminished to nearly zero, and the search was shut down for the winter. In July of 1991, the search began again, this time using dogs and trackers to try and locate Susan's remains. The search was intensive as searchers walked at arm's length of each other, scanning every meter of the surrounding acres of wilderness for evidence or remains. Some possible tracks were found indicating a person had suffered an injury, but no other evidence was recovered. Sheriff Baldwin said, quote, I believe that Susan Adams' remains are still in that area, but feel that any future organized search would not be effective in locating her remains. No further evidence has been located, and Susan remains missing. Theories include that she got lost or injured. A psychic predicted that she had fallen off of a cliff and sustained head injuries. There is a strong possibility in this rugged wilderness, however, that Susan had not even intended to go on a hike. Most believe she was simply walking to the nearby meadow to watch birds. Foul play suspects include the chef at base camp, who was the last person to see Susan alive. He could have disposed of her body, explaining why no remains were found. Others suspect her husband, Tom, saying he went searching for her in the meadow and might have killed her in an altercation. No evidence of an attack was found by searchers. A wild animal attack would also be a possibility, but no signs of blood or clothing were ever found. Susan's family is still waiting for closure.
On August 6, 2014, Arvin Nelson, an experienced hiker, set off on a solo hike through the Ventana Wilderness Area along California's coast near Big Sur State Park. Arvin had lived in the Big Sur area for years, and his outgoing personality made him well-liked by many. His friends attested to Arvin's familiarity with the surrounding area and his skills as a long-distance hiker. A friend dropped Arvin off at China Camp, a base camp high and deep in the forest where he started his hike. Carrying food and water to last a week, he hiked towards the eastern side of the Ventana Wilderness, near Pine Ridge Trail, an area he had never visited before. The trail was 23 miles at an elevation of 5,500 feet, an easy trek for an experienced hiker like Arvin. Arvin's friends expected him to arrive at Big Sur Station by August 14th. On August 5th, Arvin happened upon an isolated cabin deep in the forest. He heard music coming from inside, so he approached. There, he met Jack English and his son, Dennis, who had been playing a guitar. They had been living in that cabin for 13 years. Reportedly, they spent two days together, playing music and taking nearby hikes. On August 8th, the father and son were picked up by a helicopter, and Arvin saw them off. Arvin told Dennis, the son, that he planned on staying another day before hiking the 11 miles to Skye's Hot Springs on Sunday, August 10th. This was the last time Arvin was ever seen. Skye's is a popular camp and a 10-mile hike from Big Sur Station where Arvin had planned to end his trek. The trail is considered strenuous and takes about six hours of hiking. The trail goes up and down in elevation considerably, and to arrive at the camp, one must cross the Big Sur River several times. On top of this, it was a particularly hot and dry day, and the trail has been described as having little shade. When Arvin does not arrive at Big Sur Station as planned on August 14th, his friends and family notify authorities, and search and rescue operations begin where he was last seen. With the cooperation of the California Highway Patrol, the National Guard, and the Coast Guard, the search is formed by one airplane, three helicopters, and more than 30 ground searchers per day, scouring the region. Arvin had plenty of gear and food with him, so authorities continued the search for eight days because his chances of survival were higher. At the very least, they expected to find some of his belongings as clues to where he had gone. To this day, not a single sign of Arvin has ever been found. The search was shut down, and friends of Arvin gathered to limit and memorialize him. One friend said, quote, He's the most open, friendly, and enthusiastic person in Big Sur. Truly. According to Arvin's friends, there are many rough, backcountry people operating in the Ventana wilderness, and it's possible he could have stumbled upon illegal cannabis growers or survivalists and was killed in an altercation. Another theory is that his disappearance could have been racially motivated, as Arvin was African-American. Others theorize that something may have happened at Jack English's cabin. Some say the cabin could have been targeted by thieves, as Jack English had been making violin bows worth more than $2,000 each. Others have considered suicide, but friends refute this, saying Arvin had no depression or suicidal tendencies and was positive and an outgoing person. No one will ever know how Arvin Nelson disappeared in the Ventana wilderness without a single trace, but family and friends hold out hope that one day the mystery will be solved. In July of 1997, newlyweds Amy Betchel and her husband Steve bought their first house together in Lander, Wyoming. They were fitness enthusiasts and moved to Lander for its rugged terrain, where Amy could go running while Steve went climbing on its rocky cliffs. Amy was a strong distance runner and aspired to qualify for the 2000 Olympic marathon trials. On the morning of July 24th, Steve left to go rock climbing and Amy taught a children's weightlifting class in town. Amy had told her husband that she had several errands to run that day, including calling the phone company and getting the gas turned on at their new home. She stopped at the Camera Connection photo store at 2.30 p.m. and then visited the local art gallery, Gallery 331. She had a chat with the gallery owner, Greg Wagner. This was the last sighting of Amy before her disappearance. Amy had planned to go for a jog on Loop Road in the Shoshone National Forest, where she was mapping out the course of a 10K run she was organizing. Steve returned home from his rock climbing trip at 4.30 p.m. Around 8 p.m., he visited his neighbors, Todd and Amy Skinner, while they were having dinner. The Skinners then went out for a movie and returned around 11 p.m. Steve tells them that Amy has still not returned home. The Skinners began searching for Amy in places she might normally jog, while Steve waits at home in case she calls. At 1 a.m., after driving on Loop Road for an hour, the Skinners found Amy's white Toyota station wagon. 
The vehicle was unlocked and found half a mile from Fire Lake, where Loop Road joined the Burnt Gluch turnoff. Amy had planned this point to be the end of the 10K run. All that remained were her sunglasses, a to-do list, and car keys. There was no sign of a struggle inside or near the vehicle, but her wallet was missing. By the next morning, the search had expanded to over 100 volunteers, utilizing ATVs, dogs, and dirt bikes to search for Amy. On the day after, horses and helicopters joined the search. The search area was expanded to a 30-mile radius, but they found no trace of her. Only a single footprint similar to her sneaker was found on Loop Road, but was lost before police could retrieve it. The search was called off after eight relentless days of searching. At first, investigators suspected that Amy had become injured in the wilderness or attacked by an animal, but no evidence of blood, body parts, or torn clothing was ever found. Upon searching the couple's property, investigators turned up some disturbing poetry and journals written by Steve. Some of them described violence towards women, and specifically, Amy. When questioned, Steve got a lawyer and refused to take a polygraph test. This made investigators, the residents of Lander, and the media grow very suspicious of Steve. However, Steve had an alibi. He was with friend and mountain athlete Sam Leitner, scouting a new climbing spot in the mountains above Dubois. He had brought their dog, Johns, with them. Some questioned whether Steve would have had time to go to Shoshone and carry out the crime, considering the distance from Dubois. Amy's brother, Nell, was angry with Steve's reluctance to cooperate fully with investigators. He told the sheriff that during a recent dinner with Amy and Steve, Nell noticed that Amy had a bruise on her arm. Amy joked that Steve can get a little rough sometimes. Nell recalls, quote, Amy just laughed it off, would not look me in the eye, and I said, that is not a normal reaction, particularly for Amy. Amy's two sisters, when on the Geraldo Rivera show on February 3, 1998, publicly pled for Steve to be more cooperative. Another theory for what could have happened was at the time ignored by investigators, who had zeroed in on Steve as the person of interest in Amy's disappearance. There was a serial killer active at that time, Dale Wayne Eaton, who is also known as the Great Basin Serial Killer. His brother, Richard Eaton, tipped off the sheriff's office that Dale had been camping at the Burnt Gulch area at the time of Amy's disappearance. Amy had been marking her 10K running route along some of the Eaton brothers' favorite elk hunting and trout fishing spots. Dale was known for cleverly disposing of bodies, so that's why Amy might have never been found. Dale's mental health has diminished while on death row, so we may never know if he had anything to do with Amy's disappearance. Thelma Pauline Melton and her husband, Bob, spent their golden years living in an Airstream trailer. They would spend several months in the Airstream trailer before returning to their Jacksonville home every winter. In 1981, Polly and Bob parked their trailer at the base of the North Carolina side of the Great Smoky Mountains. There, they rented a private campsite with about 10 other couples. The others on the site were close-knit, and no newcomers could join the campsite without unanimous approval from the rest of the group. Bob was Polly's third husband, and they had married six years prior in 1975. Polly had no children, while Bob had two sons from a previous marriage, and his health was declining. On the 25th of September, Thelma cooked some food for her and Bob to eat later that day, and then left to hike up in the Deep Creek Trail with two of her friends, Red and Trula. The trail they were walking is listed as easy, and Polly knew the area very well. After an hour of walking, Polly suddenly picked up her pace and started walking ahead of her companions. They saw her walk over a small hill on the trail and go out of sight. Her friends thought that they would see her back at the trailer. However, when they arrived back at the trailer, Polly was nowhere to be found. Bob had been in the trailer when they went for the hike and hadn't seen her since she left. Polly's friends went back to the area they last saw her and began searching for her, but they could find no trace of her. She was reported missing two hours later to the park rangers. Polly was terrified of snakes and her friends say that she would not go off trail. As the vegetation on both sides was very thick, anyone going off the trail would have had some disturbance, but they couldn't find any disturbance anywhere along the trail. It is believed that Polly wouldn't have been able to go far in the short time as she suffered from high blood pressure and nausea. Over the course of that week, over 150 people and nine search dogs searched for Polly. 
One of the dogs did find a trail on a downed tree near the creek, and searchers believe that Polly may have stopped to rest there for a moment. However, the dogs did not pick up any other scent at any other location. Rangers posted pictures and spoke with many campers, hikers, and fishermen, but no signs of Polly were ever found. At the time of her disappearance, Polly was not thought to be suicidal. She had suffered through depression when her mother died in 1978 and had used Valium, a benzodiazepam, frequently in 1979, but had stopped taking them before 1981. However, her husband's bottle of Valium was found to be missing on the day she disappeared. It is unknown if she took the pills with her. The only thing out of the ordinary cited by her friends before her disappearance was that she had decided against volunteering at the Presbyterian Nutritional Center, where she had served meals to senior citizens every day for the past four years whenever she lived in North Carolina. At the end of a shift, the volunteers at the center would write down the next day that they would be in. On the day before, Polly for some reason did not write down that she'd be back the next day. Moreover, on the day before her disappearance, it was reported that she'd made several phone calls using the facility's phone. She had never used that phone in the four years that she had been volunteering there. Police were unable to trace the phone calls, and it is unknown if it's related to her disappearance. Her pastor mentioned that Polly might have been having an affair. However, there's no evidence to support this. Months after Polly disappeared in April of 1982, a check made payable to Polly Melton was cashed in Birmingham, Alabama. The police followed the lead, but nothing came of it. Polly remains missing to this day. Everett Roos was born in California on March 28, 1914, to Stella and Christopher Roos. Everett grew up to become an artist and a free spirit. He had begun writing, sketching, and clay modeling at a very young age. Everett was enamored by nature, and starting in 1931, at the young age of 16, he set on solo hiking trips by horse and burro through Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. He wrote about his experiences, views, and people he met along the way. In 1934, he worked with University of California archaeologists near Kayenta and took part in a Hopi religious ceremony, as well as learned to speak Navajo. He sold a few prints and watercolors to pay for his travels, but he depended mostly on his parents for support. On November 20th, 1934, Everett traveled alone into the Utah desert out of Escalante, taking two burros as pack animals. Before leaving, he told his parents that he would be unreachable for two to three months. He never returned. After three months of not hearing anything from him, his parents began to get worried. They sent a letter to the post office of Escalante, Utah on February 7, 1935. The commissioner of Garfield County saw the letter and decided to organize a search party. Everett's burrows were found near the north side of Davis Gulch, a canyon of the Escalante River. There was evidence of a campsite as he had made a corral for his burrows. An inscription was found nearby with the words NEMO, November 1934. However, no sign of Everett was ever found. In 1957, some camping equipment was found stashed in a cave nearby, but Everett's parents were not sure if it belonged to Everett. In 2009, University of Colorado researchers found some human bones 60 miles from where his burrows were found. Bones and teeth found allegedly matched Everett's race, age, size, and facial features. A few months later, the DNA in the bones appeared to match Everett's. Moreover, an elderly Navajo claimed that Everett was murdered by two Ute Native Americans who wanted his burrows. But after further DNA analysis, it was confirmed that the remains did not belong to Everett. He remains missing to this day. On a clear and sunny Sunday afternoon, April 30th, 1978, third grader Christopher William Vigil, an energetic nine-year-old, went on a hike, as he often did, with his mother and younger brother up Gray Rock Mountain Trail in Colorado. Gray Rock Mountain is located in the Poudre Canyon in Poudre Park, Colorado, off Highway 14. And while Chris and his family loved to explore the outdoors, they had never been to Grey Rock before. The nine-year-old, like most boys his age, ambitious and eager, ran ahead of his slower counterparts up the rocky hiking trail, eager to get to the top. His mother, Marianne Vigil, had his toddler brother, Eric Vigil, four years old, 
in tow and was struggling to keep the four-year-old engaged enough to continue the hike, so she allowed Chris to run ahead. The mother reports that at some point the toddler, Eric, flat out refused to continue hiking, but she does not explain why she didn't insist upon looking for Christopher until two hours later. Marianne last saw Chris around 2.30 p.m., but didn't officially report him as missing to the police until 5.30 or 6 p.m. After almost a week of searching and with upwards of 1,000 man-hours put into the search every day, rescuers and volunteers alike were low in morale and spirit. All in all, 170 rescue searchers combed the area for Christopher, along with 30 men on horseback and three helicopters. The entire community at this point had pitched in with kitchen workers preparing food for the rescue parties and organized and meticulous searches being enacted by both family members and strangers. Christopher's parents, Leroy and Marianne Vigil, say their son was knowledgeable about hiking and was well-versed in trail safety. He was a straight-A student and an avid runner. He would run two miles after school on the track. He was also a strong swimmer and would swim laps. The first evening's weather, after gorgeous temperatures throughout the day, took an unfortunate and dismal turn with freezing temperatures of 30 degrees, with snow and fog hampering the search for Christopher, causing rescue personnel to doubt his survival for much longer if not found and taken out of the cold. The volunteer search party would begin at 4 a.m. and would search until dark, but to no avail. Police were very concerned as Christopher was dressed in light clothing, a green shirt, green plaid pants, blue tennis shoes, and a maroon jacket, and police feared he would not survive the night. Sustenance was also an issue as the can of Diet Pepsi Chris walked away with was the only nutrition he had on him. Later, his mother would recall having had a recent talk with Christopher in regards to another girl who had gone missing on a trail and had survived because she had candy in her pocket. Based on recalling this conversation, Marianne believes Christopher may have also had candy in his pocket. While many townsfolk volunteered to assist in the search, the sheriff's department became frustrated with amateur hikers who felt they could venture into the unforgiving wilderness without a compass or even a topographical map. These inexperienced volunteers would sometimes come down with hypothermia from being improperly dressed, and others would leave because of the cold without informing the other members of the search party, leading to the search party believing that one of their own members had also gone missing and causing unnecessary stress and rigorous work for all involved. With the Colorado weather being highly variable and unpredictable, the clear Sunday that Chris had been missing was in existence no more. Fog and snow made a helicopter search impossible on May 1st, the morning after Chris went missing, but on May 3rd, the weather cleared and warmed and a helicopter search was able to be implemented. However, it yielded no insight. At this point, investigators believed that, with the extreme weather, if Chris hadn't made it off the mountains yet, his chances of survival in the nighttime cold were slim to none. Rescue workers poured over between 15 and 20 square miles of land with altitudes as high as 8,000 feet. The rocky terrain was some of the most unforgiving in the Fort Collins area, and rescue workers feared for their own safety as well as Chris's. On day five of the search, with helicopters in use for the last three days, police tried an entirely new approach. They intentionally lost three youngsters around the same ages as Chris on the mountain. However, these youngsters were paired up with members of the sheriff's office the whole time. The three children, along with their three partners, were shown the trailhead where Marion expected Chris to return, and then the pairs were dropped off in a meadow towards the top of a mountain by a helicopter and was told to find their way back. The sheriff's department were curious to see where the children, Chris's age, would go when they realized they were not on the trail. Two of the three children followed the creek and skipped the trail entirely, sometimes walking directly over it in favor of following the water. The sheriff's department says that had they continued to do so, they would eventually have found their way off the mountain within hours. The other child went up the mountain in search of higher ground, 
and became disoriented and misjudged the target of the home trail as being some four miles away from where it actually was. Based on insight gained from this experiment, rescue workers doubled down on the immediate area where Chris went missing, looking literally under every bush, rock, tree, or shrub. While searches were happening, police were imploring anyone who may have seen Chris that day and was willing to give insight on his movements on that fateful Sunday afternoon to come forward. As it was a weekend afternoon, the vigils weren't the only ones on the trail soaking up the sun. There was Alan Chopin, a blonde man hiking alone on that Sunday, who said he saw Christopher on the trail. Christopher's mother, in an interview dated May 5th of that year, stated Alan told her that he had been sitting near the top of the mountain, eating lunch, when Chris came up and started talking to him. Chris was reportedly very social and would talk to anybody. Alan reportedly shared some food with Chris before offering to walk back to the trail with Christopher. Christopher refused, instead asking where a different unmarked trail would take him, to which Alan replied he did not know. Chris ran off and that was the last time Alan saw him. Alan continued up the trail and about five minutes later hiked past Carol and Rebecca. At this point, all four hikers are meandering their way up the mountain. Carol and Rebecca, who were also hiking at the time of Christopher's disappearance, later told investigators that they spotted Chris walking ahead of them on the trail after he had spoken to Alan and after he had explored what Alan recalled him referencing as the drainage. So, investigators knew that he made it out of the drainage area that he had told Alan he wanted to explore. Christopher, spotting the girls, asked them, Did you see where the man went? To which Carol pointed up the trail. Chris then asked, Are you going up the rocks? They answered, Yes, if we ever make it. And Chris went on. They assumed that Alan was Chris's father, based on the closeness and time that both Alan and Chris passed the women. While on their hike, Carol and Rebecca also saw an unknown man sitting on some rocks near Christopher. This man, they described, had dark hair and dark skin, wearing a straw cowboy hat with the camera hanging around his neck. This man did not match the description of the other witness that came forward, Alan Chopin, and has never been identified. The two women sat down on a log within the vicinity of the unidentified man, uphill of him, but not within sight of him. Shortly after they started eating, they heard a young boy's voice yelling in what seemed like distress. The woman also said they heard a man's voice. They presumed it was Chris arguing with Alan, who they thought was his dad, but they did not know for sure as Alan never spoke to them. After what seemed like a couple minutes of arguing, Chris started yelling for what Carol and Rebecca would describe as, quote, simply yelling just for yelling's sake. Based on this alarming turn, one of the women wanted to check on the situation, but, out of an abundance of fear and caution for their own safety, they stayed put, and the yelling ceased almost as quickly as it had begun. When the women walked past that same area after eating and hearing the ruckus, they saw only a dropped Diet Pepsi can. Christopher had been drinking a Diet Pepsi as he ambled up the trail. Christopher, explains his family, was a consummate nature lover and would never have littered. Rebecca picked up the Diet Pepsi can and stored it in her backpack to throw away when she got back to the parking lot. It was never recovered. Later, when Alan hiked back down to the trail and was informed by Marianne that Christopher had not returned, Alan ran back up to the area where he had last seen Chris, where he then encountered Carol and Rebecca, who he asked for help. The woman told Alan they had not seen Chris since earlier, when Chris hiked past them up the mountain, which happened shortly after Alan saw him. They recalled that, quote, We heard him yelling and another voice and we thought it was you, to which Alan replied, It was not me. They concluded it must have been the man with the straw hat and camera instead. The pair of women reassured Alan that there were still 90 minutes of daylight left, and the woman offered to help look for Chris as they made their way back down the mountain. Alan ran off, obviously worried for the well-being of the boy he had happened to cross earlier in the day. When the ladies returned to their car, they drove around for a bit, looking for Chris from inside their vehicle. When they circled back around to the parking lot, they saw a red fire truck and were relieved that they would be taking over the search from there. 
By this time, it was around 5.30, and it had been over three hours since Chris had run ahead of Marianne and little Eric. When the women were pressed to recall what cars were in the parking lot, they could only recall two, a white Volvo station wagon and a light green car. On Friday, almost six days after his disappearance, the search for Christopher was suspended indefinitely due to an anticipated three to five feet of snow coming in and continuing to do so for the foreseeable future. The year Chris went missing, there were multiple alleged sightings of him. In July of 1978, a boy who was deaf and unable to talk communicated that he had seen Chris selling newspapers on the street. By reading lips, the boy was able to infer that Chris was selling newspapers to win a trip to Disneyland. Pueblo police were sent to interview the boy, but with so little info and, from their perspective, a tenuous source, no official report was filed. But two weeks later, Don and Cindy Dooley, a vacationing couple from Des Moines, Iowa, were visiting Cheyenne, a town in Wyoming about 45 minutes from Fort Collins, Colorado. While there, they claimed they were approached by an intelligent, tan boy with long hair who told him he was selling newspapers, and if he sold the most, he would win a trip to Disneyland. This was the same story as the deaf boy in Pueblo, Colorado. This boy was also wearing a green shirt. Recall that Chris was seen in a green shirt when he went missing, and seemed dirty and sun-exposed. About 15 minutes later, the same couple spotted the same boy sitting with another boy his age. When the couple went to dinner, the wife spotted a missing persons flyer with Christopher's info. Oh my god, that is the little boy we just seen selling papers, she yelled, clutching her husband's arm. Police were called, as well as the father of Chris, whose information was on the flyer. Mr. Vigil drove to Cheyenne, but found nothing. A few months later, in Wyoming in the month of September, a trucker, Lynn Modi, reported being approached by a boy matching the description of Chris. 4, 8, and 60 pounds. Originally, Chris was reported missing as 4, 8, and 74 pounds, but his tremulous ordeal could have caused him to lose weight. The boy asked the man for a dollar and some food, but the man, suspicious, refused. The boy thanked him while looking rather nervous and walked back to what the trucker remembered as a turquoise or a light green car. Recall Carol and Rebecca saw that same color car in the parking lot of Grey Rock Mountain. The next morning, the trucker drove into Cheyenne and saw the missing persons poster with Christopher's photo on it, and he immediately called state police. The Fort Collins police made the 45-minute drive to Cheyenne, where they interviewed the trucker. He claimed he was 100% sure the boy who had approached him was the same boy as on the missing flyer. Furthermore, he was so sure that he adamantly turned down ideas of receiving the $1,000 reward as he just wanted to help this boy find his family. That same month, Mr. Claude Ryans reported seeing Christopher looking dirty and haggard walking down Temple Avenue in Salt Lake City, Utah, which is the state that borders Colorado. In 2012, Marianne gave the National Database for Missing and Exploited Children a lock of Christopher's first haircut as a baby for DNA analysis. In 2013, a person named Julie Ferrer of South Dakota called police and said she had information on a boy who went missing in 1978. She claimed she knew who had taken him and gave a specific name, although we're not naming him in this documentary at this point because there's absolutely no available evidence that connects the two, and internet vigilantes are a real issue in cases like these. Her statements are largely blacked out in the released police files. She could not be reached for comment. If you have any information on Christopher Vigil, please contact the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children at 1-800-843-5678. Garrett Bardsley. On Friday, August 20th, 2004, while on a Boy Scouts camping trip, Garrett Bardsley, age 12, and his father, Kevin, were camping in the Utah woods on Uinta Mountains. The pair were fishing on the lake, 140 meters from the troop's campsite. Garrett got a little too close to the water while fishing, completely soaking his shoes and socks. He decided to walk back to his campsite to change. The scouts' troops' tents were a mere 140 meters, or 450 feet away, so Garrett's father allowed his 12-year-old son to go back to his tent alone. For comparison's purposes, 
The distance between the lake and the campsite was only that of the length of one and a half football fields. There was no need to worry because they had walked that trail several times and Garrett had also completed the Boy Scouts Wilderness Survival Training. Kevin kept his eyes on Garrett as he walked around the lake and even shouted directions, reminding Garrett which path would lead him straight back to the camp. But after 20 minutes, Kevin wondered what was taking his son so long to return to him. The now concerned father returned to the camp, but Garrett was nowhere to be seen. Trip coordinators say they had picked the spot because it was sheltered, had easily identifiable natural landmarks, and was seemingly difficult to get lost in. Although an official search began less than 40 minutes after Garrett was last seen, the boy was nowhere to be found. After about five days, the search was no longer slated to be for that of a missing person. Instead, it became a recovery mission. Family members, neighbors, friends, and churchgoers aided officials in the search for the missing Garrett Bardsley, but he was never found. Garrett was last seen wearing a t-shirt, black hooded sweatshirt, red sweatpants, and Converse tennis shoes. The only evidence that searchers found was the boy's Nike sock, 0.8 kilometers, or five and a half miles, away from the spot where he disappeared. The local police decided that there was not enough evidence to point to a kidnapping. Officials believe the boy got lost and died of exposure. However, Kevin Bardsley says that he will never give up hope of finding his son. 4. Jared Adadero In October of 1999, Jared Adadero, 3, went on a hike up the Big South Trail in Poudre Canyon, Colorado, with a group of adults and his six-year-old sister. His father, Alan Adadero, stayed back at the lodge that he owned and operated. Alan knew the adults that were taking his children on a hike from a Christian group that had stayed at his lodge, the Poudre River Resorts, and trusted the ten adults. The group chose to hike the Comanche Peak on a trail that goes deep into the heart of the massive 260 square kilometer wildlife reserve. While on the trail, the 10 adults were split between two groups and the kids were running between the groups. Jared most likely ran ahead to catch up to the lead group and then ran past them to surprise them on the trail. This was the last time he was spotted by his group. Each member of the group gave the New York Times drastically different estimates as to how long they were hiking before anyone noticed that the toddler was gone, ranging from 20 minutes to an hour and a half. A search party with over 50 people brought dogs to look for Jared for several days, but was thwarted by an SAR helicopter crash on October 5th and snow that rolled in to the Rocky Mountains. Jared was believed to be spotted by two fishermen on the trail, who he approached and asked them if there were bears nearby. The fishermen confirmed that they were in Bear County, and then Jared left. Searchers found a set of prints that were initially thought to be Jared's, but were later identified by wildlife experts as bear tracks that were interwoven as the bear went up and down the trail. During the search, a park ranger at Mesa Verde National Park filed a sighting report at Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado, a nine-hour drive from Poudre Canyon, after seeing Jared's photo on the news while eating dinner. He was certain he had seen the boy that day and stated that the boy kept trying to hold his hand. A man who he had said walking with the boy kept calling him something like Gerald, but thought nothing of it at the time. His statement fell on deaf ears. A friend of Alan's named Cindy investigated the area where Jared had gone missing. She happened to come across a family staying at a cabin way back in the sticks, who she said was acting suspiciously. They were painting their VW van a different color when they noticed her watching. One of them jumped into a truck and sped over to her, screaming at her to leave. She told a friend who reported it to the sheriff, but it was ignored. 
Despite the extensive search, none of Jared's remains were found until 2003, a staggering 170 meters, 550 feet, above the trail in a location that is difficult even for adults to climb, they found Jared's sneakers. They appeared to be brand new, although he had been missing for years. They also found his sweatshirt, which was fully intact, and his pants, which were inside out as if they were pulled off of him. Around 45 meters, 150 feet, away from his clothing, they found one tooth and a piece of his skull. Some people have theorized that a mountain lion carried his body up the steep trail, but many others believe that he was murdered. If he had been attacked by a mountain lion or by a bear, his clothing would have been torn to shreds. To this day, Jared's case remains unsolved. Diana Robertson On December 12, 1985, 36-year-old Mike Reamer, his 21-year-old girlfriend Diana Robertson, and their two-year-old daughter Crystal left their home in Poyallup, Washington for a trip into the woods to find a Christmas tree. Mike worked as a trapper during the winter months and was also planning to use this opportunity to check his hunting traps. Later that afternoon, Crystal would be found wandering alone outside a Kmart in the town of Spanaway. Since her parents could not be located, Crystal was placed in temporary foster care and was not identified until her photo was placed in the newspaper and her maternal grandmother recognized her. Mike and Diana had vanished without a trace. All Crystal could tell police was that mommy is in the trees. Two months later, Mike Reamer's pickup truck was discovered on a remote logging road in the woods, 30 miles from the Kmart where Crystal was found. Diana Roberts' body was lying on the ground. She had been stabbed 17 times and a tube sock was wrapped around her neck. There were blood stains inside the truck, but since two months of winter weather had caused the evidence to degrade, forensic tests could not match the blood to a specific person. An envelope was found under the windshield with the words, I love you, Diana, written on it. Although her mother believed it was Mike's handwriting, it could not be confirmed. A search of the surrounding woods turned up no trace of Mike. Police explored the possibility that Mike could have killed Diana before dropping Crystal off at the Kmart. He had a history of domestic violence, and Diana had filed a restraining order against him two months prior to her death, though the couple eventually reconciled. Another complication was that four months earlier, the forest area where Crystal's parents disappeared had been the scene of two brutal murders. 27-year-old Stephen Harkins and his 42-year-old girlfriend, Ruth Cooper, were murdered while camping near a lake 15 miles away from the logging road. Stephen was shot to death inside his sleeping bag while Ruth's remains were found a mile and a half away months later. Like Diana Robertson, Ruth had a tube sock tied around her neck with the same type of knot, suggesting that they were both killed by the same person. Since Mike Reamer was known to check his animal traps in the same area where the couple was found, police wondered if he might have been a serial killer who was responsible for both murders. Police had not been able to determine if he was alive or dead, or if he was the killer or a victim. Mike's whereabouts remained unknown until March 2011, when a hiker discovered a skull fragment in a wooded area located a mile from where Diana was found. When police searched the area, they found a human mandible and dental records confirmed that it belonged to Mike. The rest of Mike's remains were never found, and his exact cause of death could not be determined but the condition of the skull fragment seems to indicate that he was not killed by a gunshot to the head. While it's possible Mike could have murdered Diana, driven Crystal to the Kmart, returned to the murder scene, and gone into the woods to commit suicide, the most likely theory seems to be that an unknown killer murdered both couples and dropped Crystal off. Police have since ruled out Mike as a suspect in the double murder. 
Randy Doyle Parscale, Jr. Randy, then 10 years old and a third grader at Roberts Elementary School, was hiking in Pepper Sauce Canyon near Oracle with his father and other family members. Randy was mere feet ahead of the family members, exploring slightly ahead of the rest of the group. As he turned around a bend on the trail, he simply vanished, despite the fact that family members turned onto the same bend a minute later and then began rushing around to see where he went seconds after that. While multiple law enforcement units were dispatched to look for Randy within minutes of his disappearance, including canine units and helicopters, Randy was never seen again. Theories about Randy's disappearance ranged from kidnapping to falling down one of the old mine shafts in the area. The only clue was the bull's eye footprints that Randy had seemingly left, tracked by an experienced rescue worker who was able to follow the footprints until they abruptly ended at a remote dirt road. Also on this road, was the imprint of tire tracks, which investigators thought could indicate Randy was picked up by a vehicle. In 1985, more than six years after Randy's disappearance, a woman told investigators she had found a dollar bill with the words, I'm alive in Phoenix, Arizona. Help me, Randy Parscale. The bill was investigated but turned up no further clues. Four years after that, a man working a construction site using Parscale's social security number was rumored to match the description of the age progression photos of Randy. His father went to Phoenix to investigate the claim, but the mysterious man was no longer employed at the work site. The construction worker was never located, and his identity has not been confirmed. Classified by police as a non-family abduction, Randy is still missing to this day. Barry Zeldin Barnett Barry Zeldin was a 74-year-old experienced hunter who lived in May's Landing with his wife, Janet Zeldin. On Monday, October 7, 2013, he told Janet he was planning to put some bait at a deer stand near Chatsworth in the Warren Grove Recreation Area and left his home with his dog Taffy. This would be the last time anyone saw him. Barry signed in at the Audubon Gun Club on Route 563 at 9.55 a.m. Monday morning. Hunters always sign in there so that everyone knows who's out there. He did not return home that night. At this point, Janet wasn't worried as Barry was known to make some spontaneous hunting trips that lasted several days. The next two days, Janet tried calling him, but all her calls went to voicemail. On the third day, she tried to drive to the Audubon Gun Club to find someone that would help her find Barry, but she wasn't able to find the club. On the fourth day, she tried again, and this time she was able to find the club. She got some members of the club to help her look for Barry. They searched around the area, but couldn't find any sign of him. Then, on the fifth day, while searching for Barry, a few members of the club found Barry's 1972 Chevrolet Blazer. Inside the SUV, they found his car keys, still in the ignition, his cell phone still on the dashboard, and his dog Taffy still waiting for him. The windows of the car were left down, and Taffy had apparently survived on rainwater and corn and molasses meant for the deer. In regards to the dog, Janet theorized that, quote, Barry must have left her to check on the deer stand or to put some apples out, and there was a medical emergency. Taffy does what she's told, so he must have told her to stay put. The New Jersey State Police and State Park Police carried out a massive search using helicopters and canine units. At first, the searchers concentrated on the Warren Grove Recreation Area, but they soon expanded to include other parts of the wilderness closer to Bass River State Forest in New Jersey. The search was soon called off when they couldn't find any sign of Barry anywhere in the area. The searchers returned a few more times to the area, but they still couldn't find any trace of Barry. Janet said, quote, Taffy is always looking for Barry to come home. When someone comes to the door or she hears a squeak of the garage door, she runs to it and she clings to me all the time, which she never did. Barry remains missing to this day. Bobby Packnan. In August 1963, Bobby Packnan, along with his three brothers, Ted, Jim, and Bill, 
went on a camping trip along with their parents at Deep Lake Resort in Stevens County, Washington, about 20 miles from the Canadian border. On the 3rd of August, Bobby, Jim, and Bill went for a hike with their mother, Edna, alongside an isolated logging trail near the campsite. Ted and his father had decided to stay behind at the campsite and go fishing instead. During their hike, Bill heard a creek nearby and asked his mother if he could check it out. Edna agreed and followed him, telling Jim and Bobby to wait on the trail. However, Jim didn't listen and followed Bill and his mother down the creek, leaving Bobby standing alone. The creek was only 100 to 150 feet from the trail, and they were only gone for a couple of minutes, but when they returned to the trail, Bobby was nowhere to be seen. He had been barefoot, but no footprints were found. They searched him and called out to him, but couldn't find any sign of him. They eventually notified authorities, and an extensive search was carried out involving bloodhounds and over 4,000 volunteers. Searchers traveled deep into the remote Deep Lake area that surrounded the campsite. The area was hilly and rugged and was difficult to navigate. Sniffer dogs were brought in, and they picked up a scent that ran for a couple of miles before abruptly stopping at a fork in the road. At the time of his disappearance, Bobby was 2 feet 8 inches tall, 30 pounds, with blonde hair. He was wearing blue shorts and was barefoot. Authorities considered the possibility that Bobby could have been abducted, but due to the remote location where the family was located, they believed it's unlikely. Authorities theorized that Bobby got lost trying to follow Jim and was attacked by a wild predator, such as a cougar, bear, or an eagle. Both of Bobby's parents are now deceased, but his brothers are all still alive. Bobby's case remains unsolved to this day. Connie Johnson Connie Johnson was a 76-year-old experienced outdoors woman working as a camp cook for Ritchie Outfitters of Salmon, Idaho in the area around Fog Mountain near Big Rock. Ritchie Outfitters organized hunting trips in the Montana and Idaho wilderness. She'd previously worked as a U.S. Forest Service wilderness ranger at the Moose Creek Ranger Station. She was also a member of the Selway Bitterroot Foundation, and she frequently led young people and other groups on tours of the backcountry. She was known to have very good survival skills and 25 years of wilderness experience. The camp she was working at was only accessible on foot or by horseback. On October 2, 2018, the hunters left the camp for a while. Connie stayed at the camp along with her dog, Ace. The next day, Connie contacted the hunters by radio, but they were unable to understand what she was saying. When the hunters returned on October 5th, Connie and Ace were nowhere to be seen. She had left her jacket behind on a table, lying on top of her gun. After searching around the area and finding no sign of either of them, the hunters notified the authorities. A massive search was carried out, involving aircraft deploying FLIR heat technology from the U.S. Air Force, the Idaho National Guard, the Clearwater County Backcountry Helicopter Rescue Team, and several teams of tracking dogs and searchers on foot. However, no trace of Connie or her dog was found, and the search was called off on October 16th. Three weeks later, Ace would turn up at the Moose Creek Ranger Station. Ace was discovered about 15 miles from the hunting camp where Connie was last seen. He was reportedly found in good condition, not hungry or struggling in any way, and was checked over by a vet. Connie's family worked with the True North Search Dogs, a nonprofit organization out of Helena, Montana, to transport Ace back to the search area in an attempt to find Connie, but to no avail. Connie's daughter does not believe her mother's disappearance was intentional. It's also worth noting that another man would disappear on the same day, not too far from Connie. Terrence Woods would go missing around 5 p.m. on the same day in the Oro Grande area of Idaho. The 27-year-old was a production assistant from Maryland, helping film a documentary on abandoned gold mines for a British TV show called Whitewater. He was supposed to be working on the film until November, but, a few days before his disappearance, he texted his parents to say he was cutting his trip short and would come home on October 10th. When the police questioned the production team, they said that after finishing the shoot and when the crew was wrapping up, Terrence approached a ridge which dropped steeply away down a hillside to the forest below. When all of a sudden, he dropped his two-way radio that he was holding and started running fast down the hill into the forest below. 
At first, the rest of the crew thought he might have fallen off the cliff, but when they arrived at the cliff, they saw him down at the bottom, still running until he disappeared into the trees. The crew called out for him, but he didn't return. They went looking for him, but couldn't find him. They would eventually report him missing to the police. Despite an extensive search of the area, no sign of Terrence was ever found. Connie and Terrence remain missing to this day. Stacy Aris. On the 25th of July, 1981, 14-year-old Stacy Aris from Saratoga went on a four-day horse riding trip with her father in the Sunrise Meadows area of Yosemite National Park in California. They were part of an eight-person group riding on horses and mules. The group reached a cluster of cabins designed for overnight stay at Sunrise High Sierra Camp, they tied up their horses and mules and went indoors to freshen up. Stacy cleaned up, showered, and changed clothes. While the group was resting, Stacy told her father she wanted to hike down and take pictures of a nearby lake. She asked him if he wanted to go with her, but he declined. An elderly man named Gerald Stewart from their group accompanied her instead. The group saw the two going down the hill towards the lake. After walking a little while down the hill, Gerald felt tired and sat down. Stacy then told Gerald that she would continue and go to the lake. The lake could have been either a few hundred feet away or as long as 1.5 miles away. The exact location is not clear. The group watched Stacy walk further towards the lake. They then saw her go behind some trees and disappear from sight. This would be the last time she was ever seen. When Stacy didn't return, the elderly man got up to look for her, then gathered the remainder of the group to search more extensively. He later reported that he'd spoken with a group of hikers, but they said they hadn't seen her. The group did find a lens from her camera, but no other trace of her. After the initial search, Stacy was reported missing to the authorities. Rescue crews invested extensive efforts to finding her. About 150 people looked for the teen, which included roughly 67 Mountain Rescue Association volunteers, dogs, and helicopters, all canvassing a three to five square mile area around Sunrise Lake. Despite this, the camera lens is the only clue. Stacy reportedly had several other items on her person. She was wearing an ankle bracelet and possibly stud earrings, as well as carrying binoculars and her camera. None of these items ever turned up. It is possible that she was abducted as there was no sign of an animal attack and given the proximity to the camp, it's hard to believe she would have lost her way. For 39 years, Stacy has remained missing. Gloria McDonald on the 26th of January, 2001, Gloria White Moore McDonald went for a hike in Queen Wilhelmina State Park in Polk County, Arkansas. She was accompanied by her husband, her husband's son, and the son's girlfriend. The group began heading down towards the Lover's Leap area of the park at around 12.25 p.m. About 150 yards down the trail, the group found several tree limbs and debris blocking the trail. At this point, Gloria decided to not continue any further and told the others that she was returning to the lodge, which housed a restaurant, gift shop, and additional facilities. Others decided to continue on without her. About 30 minutes later, the group returned to the lodge, but they could not find Gloria anywhere. The car the group had used to travel to the lodge was parked in the same location they had left it, and Gloria's purse was locked inside. A search of the car indicated none of Gloria's personal belongings were missing. On January 27th, the Arkansas State Police special agents were contacted by Polk County Sheriff's deputies at Mina after a search of the Queen Wilhelmina Lodge area failed to find any sign of Gloria. An extensive search of the area was conducted using sniffer dogs, helicopters, and search and rescue teams. The sniffer dogs followed a scent which led down to a paved road below the lodge, but they lost the scent at the road. At the time, there were about six people there who worked for the state park. 
the kitchen help, waitresses, as well as a few men piling brush and cleaning up after a previous night's storm. However, none of them had seen Gloria. Gloria was a court reporter for the Mina Star newspaper, and some believed that someone she had written about could have abducted her. But after reviewing her articles and notes, they couldn't find any clue that might lead to her abduction. The family theorized that she may have walked up on something involving illegal drug activity and was murdered to keep her quiet. Police had initially suspected Gloria's husband, Daniel, as having something to do with her disappearance, and they asked him to take a lie detector test, which he passed. Less than a week after his wife's disappearance, Daniel said he would move back to Florida and didn't want to stay in Mina, which was considered odd as his wife was still missing, and if she did return, she would return to her house in Mina first. In an interview, Daniel also said that he couldn't imagine anyone abducting his wife, quote, for her body, end quote, as she couldn't be considered pretty. Daniel hasn't been ruled out as a suspect, but there's no evidence against him either. Daniel's son said that his father can sometimes come across the wrong way, but he's a great man. He just says whatever comes to his mind at the time. His son said that all three members from the group were interrogated separately. Police had seized his camera and found pictures taken on the day, but couldn't find any photos of Gloria. Besides Daniel, Daniel's son, and Daniel's girlfriend, no one else had seen Gloria in the park except for a maintenance worker. The worker had said that he may have seen a woman in a yellow jacket, which Gloria was wearing at the time, but he wasn't sure. Gloria was described as weighing about 120 pounds, 5 feet 6 inches tall, and wearing a bright yellow hooded jacket, blue plaid shirt, blue jeans, and tennis shoes when she was last seen. She was also seen carrying a Minolita River Zoom 90 camera at the time of her disappearance. She remains missing to this day. <laughs>